Hello, and thank you for standing by. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to Triple Flag Precious Metal C1 2024 conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, again, press star one. I would now like to turn the conference over to Sean Osner, Chief Executive Officer. Please go ahead. Thanks, Jericho. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us to discuss Triple Flag's first quarter of 2024 results. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by our CFO, Sheldon van der Kooy, and uh, for the first time, our Director of Mining, James Leal, who will join us for the Q&A portion of the call. James is a mining engineer and is responsible for portfolio management and supports technical diligence at Triple Flag. As a background, James has over 20 years of experience across mine sites, head offices, and consulting, most recently as head of Canada at Mining Plus. Triple Flag achieved a new quarterly geo sales record to start the year, with sales of roughly 28,000 gold equivalent ounces, resulting in 48 million US dollars of EBITDA during the quarter. The strong performance has positioned us well to achieve our 2024 geo sales guidance of 105 to 115,000 ounces. Most notably, in line with our guidance for a stronger 2024 due to higher gold grades from the E31 open pits at North Parks, our flagship asset delivered a nearly 90% increase in geo sales quarter on quarter. We continue to expect these pits to deliver high grades through at least 2024 and 2025, and look forward to a feasibility study for the E22 underground ore body, which our partner Evolution expects to complete by the end of Q2 of this year. E22 is expected to represent another source of high-grade gold ore at North Parks, in the medium to long term. In March of 2024, we surfaced further value from the Mavericks portfolio with a settlement agreement reached with Quo Mining on the Kensington NSR royalty, which has commenced paying and will be discussed later in the presentation. Finally, I'd be remiss not to mention the current favorable precious metals price environment, which on the back of sustained central bank buying, Chinese retail purchases and seemingly never-ending geopolitical uncertainty has remained at near record levels for gold prices and solid silver prices. It's been a great time to have continued meaningful GEO growth in our portfolio coincide with a period of strong price support. We expect to deliver our eighth consecutive year of record GEO sales in 2024, and with the first quarter of high-grade uh, growth from North Parks now achieved, we look forward to the prospect of continued high gold and silver prices on our portfolio's cash flow per share. I'll now turn it over to Sheldon to discuss our financials for the first quarter of the year. Thank you, Sean. As noted, we had a strong first quarter with the portfolio producing just under 28,000 GEOs, which puts Triple Flag right on track to achieve our 2024 guidance. As expected, North Parks and Cerro Lindo were the two largest contributors to Q1 production, with North Parks showing year-over-year growth due to the higher gold grades realized. In Q1, we also recorded our first revenues from the Kensington royalty, which we acquired as part of the Mavericks portfolio. The strong Q1 production and the record quarterly gold price resulted in record levels of revenue and adjusted EBITDA, significantly higher than the prior year period. Operating cash flow per share is the metric that I am most focused on. Our operating cash flow before working capital and taxes increased over 22% as compared to the prior year period. But as a short-term timing matter, our working capital increased by $6.5 million in Q1, resulting in bottom-line operating cash flow in the quarter that was unchanged from the prior year. Typically, our adjusted EBITDA and our operating cash flow track quite closely, and I expect that this will continue to be the case for 2024 as a whole, as the shorter-term working capital changes reverse. For 2024, we are well-positioned to drive increases in operating cash flow per share, as we are realizing higher production levels from our existing portfolio and the higher gold price is translating into increased cash flows. In Q1, the gold price averaged $2,070 per ounce, a quarterly record. But in Q2 to date, the gold price has averaged over $2,300 an ounce, a significant increase over Q1. We we, We view a growing dividend as a core part of our capital allocation strategy. 
and this quarter, our dividend has been maintained at 21 cents on an annualized basis. I'm proud that we have increased our dividend every year since our IPO. We will continue to assess potential for further increases going forward. In addition to our dividend, we also returned over $3.5 million to shareholders via share buybacks in Q1. Last, I'd like to comment on our balance sheet. We exited the quarter with net debt of just $30 million, or less than one quarter of cash flow. A clean balance sheet, robust cash flows, and our revolving credit facility of over $500 million gives us the financial capacity to deploy capital to drive further growth for the benefit of shareholders. Going to the next slide. We continue to highlight three key aspects of our investment thesis, namely asset diversification, precious metals focus, and a portfolio which is predominantly centered in Australia and the Americas. Our asset diversification is well understood. So continuing on Sean's earlier comment about a strong precious metals environment, I would like to highlight Triple Flag's 98% exposure to precious metals in Q1 2024. This pure play exposure ranks among the highest in the sector with a meaningful portion weighted to silver at 34%. I feel fortunate to have this level of exposure given the many favorable tailwinds for both gold and silver in the near to medium term. Finally, our portfolio is predominantly located in mining friendly jurisdictions, a key criteria as we look to expand our portfolio through acquisition. By geography, the country with the single greatest contribution remains Australia. Notably during the quarter, Another one of our Australian assets was featured as a core part of an M&A transaction with West Gold announcing a friendly takeover of Corora to operate the Beta Hunt mine. We are pleased to have the cash flow and exploration potential Beta Hunt spotlighted by West Gold. That was you, Sean. Thanks, Sheldon. A core part of the 2024 story for Triple Flag is our anchor asset at North Parks. To give the market better context of the impact of this expected grade improvement versus historical results, the slide highlights mill head grades at North Parks over the past three full years of our stream ownership from 2021 to 2023, which has ranged from 0.13 grams a ton to 0.17 grams a ton. Therefore, the Q1 2024 process grade of 0.28 grams a ton is undoubtedly a significant step up from the past, and Evolution Mining has done a great job in delivering what was promised. On the next slide, an asset that has been a clear winner for Triple Flag from prior year's Mavericks transaction is the Kensington NSR. Kensington is operated by Core Mining, which commenced production in 2010 with over a million ounces produced to date and is expected to have a minimum five-year reserve life by the end of 2024. The mine is located in Alaska, a jurisdiction that is no stranger to mining. With a settlement agreement now executed, this NSR commenced paying in Q1 with further shared consideration from Coor and settlement of royalties and arrears. As part of the settlement agreement, we received roughly 737,000 shares of Coor, which we divested earlier in the second quarter of 2024 in the open market. We expect to receive a further fixed value of 3.75 million US dollars worth of shares of Coor in the first quarter of 2025, which will be the final share consideration received under the agreement. We look forward to working with Cora as operating partners for the years to come on Kensington. So to end, we have had a strong start to 2024 with a new record quarter of GEOs and earnings that puts us nicely on track to achieving our guidance of 105 to 115,000 GEOs for the year. This represents our eighth consecutive projected year of record growth for our business and builds on the 34% cumulative annual growth rate in operating cash flow this team has delivered over the past seven years. We highlighted at the end of the last year a period of substantial growth from our cornerstone asset in Australia, North Parks, for the next couple of years. So to be able to demonstrate a nearly 90% increase in GEOs for the first quarter from this asset while delivering another robust performance from Seralindo as a top five asset in our portfolio is something we're very pleased with. We manage a large portfolio of 234 assets. The core assets as anchors to our portfolio and guidance are clearly delivering for our investors. And we've seen the power of a large, large portfolio being demonstrated with the Kensington royalty starting to contribute GEOs this past quarter. The two underperforming assets we've highlighted in our release today have been well communicated in the past, have been factored into our 2024 guidance, and we provided additional disclosure to make it clear 
that we're commercially well-placed if they continue to underperform to maximize value for our investors. So finally, with our ample firepower of roughly 670 million US dollars in available liquidity, as well as a cornerstone base of 32 producing assets, we're nicely diversified and well-positioned to benefit from the current metal price environment as we continue our relentless pursuit of growth and value per share for our owners. With the board and management team being large shareholders ourselves, we're completely aligned in ensuring the best outcomes and are excited about the significant opportunity ahead for our portfolio to deliver further value. So with that, Jericho, um, please, I'm happy to open the floor to questions. I'll open for your questions. So to ask a question this time, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. We're going to pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. First question comes from the line of Cosmos Q with CIBC. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks, uh, Sean, Sheldon, and team. Uh, maybe my first question is on North Park, your anchor asset. Um, as you mentioned, uh, there's going to be a feasibility study uh, to be released by the end of Q2 on the E22 underground ore body. Could you maybe share with us um, what you know yours or our expectations could be? And uh, what might be the next steps for the operator and potential timeline as well, Sean? Yeah, Cos, hi. It's it's good to hear from you. Um, Cos, I'm gonna I'm gonna really defer this question until Evolution release, um, you know, their their study in the middle of the year. And the reason is we've got a great new partnership. It's not really appropriate for me to front run it. I think all I can say in terms of expectations. I think we covered this on the last call we had a while ago, is you know, you, you've got a group here with a really impeccable track record in that jurisdiction with Cal. And my expectation is they've been very successful in taking their time, uh, investing in exploration prudently. You know, there's over a thousand square kilometer package here, all bodies open at depth. And they've been very good at, um, you know, I think studying astutely. And I think we touched on previously that uh, you know, even though there's an existing study they would have inherited on E22 uh, with yet another, um, you know, block cave, you know, they were looking at a sub-level cave as an alternative. I have no knowledge at this stage, which I can share, um, but I think, you know, that would give them perhaps earlier access and would benefit us if indeed they went that route. So, you know, we're looking forward to seeing that release. And I think if you look at the public disclosures, as you'd expect with Jake and Laurie, you know, their real focus is on just integrating the business well, um, which I believe they've done very successfully, uh, getting these studies done, and then just settling into delivering. For us, what I look for is always risk on a transition, uh, as you know, someone who's been in a lot of mining companies over the years, mm. and it's stabilization through integration. Uh, you can see from these results, they haven't, they haven't missed a beat. I think they've done very well. Um, James, I don't know if there's anything you wish to add, but... No, I think you, you captured that well, Sean. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Sean. Anything, uh, anything else? Yeah, for sure. If I uh, maybe switching gears a little bit, um, as Sean, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, it's good to see strength in the gold and silver prices year to date. Um, my, you know, question is, how does that kind of impact the opportunity set in terms of um, acquisitions? You know, new stream and royalty acquisition. As Sheldon mentioned, you have a strong balance sheet, $640 million undrawn on your line of credit. Is that kind of like, is that sufficient? You know, what type of size is that, uh, you know, does that speak to the size of these opportunities that you might be looking at? Yeah, because it's, um, you know, it's, it's an important and sort of evergreen question. I, I know some investors look at a high gold price environment and they kind of get confused by it because they say that must mean that you know, there's a fire hose of capital available to gold miners and clear, clearly there's not a lot of business therefore for streaming and royalty companies to do. And that's um, that's really not the reality. I think if you consider that nearly 70% of our ounces come from polymetallics, um, that's not by accident. I think those sorts of transactions are, are very symbiotic as we've discussed before. Um, we are seeing a lot of activity of that nature. Um, we had a board meeting yesterday, and I think we've highlighted there that 
I think it's fair to say it's probably the busiest deal pipeline we've seen in our eight-year existence. And a number of those, we've got some smaller transactions that are nice tuck-ins at decent rates of return that where we were exclusive on. And that doesn't mean we'll conclude them, but I think we've got a good line of sight on those. Um, and then there are larger ones out there, which, you know, really are substantial in size, uh, you know, many, many hundreds of millions. You can hear from Sheldon's comments that, you know, we have ample firepower, but I think part of our consideration is not only the fit for the portfolio, um, you know, as shareholders, but but very much what does the portfolio mix look like? So I think the bulk of what we're looking at, um, we can easily cover with our existing financing. There are some where we would perhaps look to syndicate uh, just purely from a portfolio mix if indeed it went that route. But um, my feeling at this stage is that uh, just given this macro environment, we're seeing really good deal flow activity, and I don't believe it's an anomaly. I suspect in this environment with rates seemingly being the way they are for, you know, for some time to come, I think it's a, it's a particularly good outlook for deal flow for us. Sheldon, is there anything you'd wish to add to that? No, I think that covers it quite well, Sean. And then, uh, Sean, maybe one last question. Um, you know, going through your income statement, I saw that there was an expected credit loss of $6.851 million as a charge. You kind of touched on it. You know, there's some operators um, that uh, have had some financial issues. I'm just trying to look for more details on it. And uh, what are they related to? Yeah, because I'm not sure there's a comment, but I want to preface this a little um, by saying, you know, I think an organization that is only looking at your things is is not, you know, we've got to balance risk and reward. And, and the whole focus here for us is staying true to the model, which I think we've demonstrated over years, and managing a portfolio. The, the, the numbers you're mentioning in particular are, are one of over 140 assets we acquired during the Mavericks transaction that we knew was problematic at the time. We're very happy with that transaction. We've announced Kensington. I think we delivered our synergies, and it's gone quite well. But, um, you know, this, this is one of the examples we've been working with the management team to try and support them while really focusing on value. You'll see, I think, with our track record as well, we've not dalliance with the idea of providing a lot of additional equity and other kind of financing. We really have stayed true to our model. But, you know, occasionally as part of the model uh, of, the, of the portfolio management, we do have, you know, impacts like that. And we're very clear. I mean, you would have seen in the last period with, um, I think we took a, charge one at the end of um, uh, of the Renard uh, experience. And at that one, we just, you know, for example, done a right back. We tend to try and err on the side of conservatism. But, Sean, do you want to pick it up? Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Sean, and thanks, thanks, Kaz. Kaz, that, that, that relates, as Sean alluded to, to uh, an expected credit loss that we recorded for uh, reflecting our investment in the Moss, in the Moss mine, and it's run by Elevation, uh, Elevation Gold. Um, Basically, uh, Elevation has been uh, quite public that they've experienced some cash flow difficulties and that they're actually looking at different alternatives. Um, at the end of the day, this is a, uh, it's a, it's a producing gold mine in the United States, a, a fantastic uh, uh, gold price en environment, um, but, but they've been a little, little tight on cash flow as they, as they branched up the new, new pad. Um, we just wanted to be conservative. We wanted to take this, uh, this allowance. Um, we'll, we'll see how their uh, their process plays out. I can't really speak too much for that, but we continue to monitor it quite closely. Um, and uh, I will I will add that you know we're in first secured position on everything there. So we just wanted to be conservative and and take this expected credit loss and uh, and 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 see how this this matter plays out. And because I think the last thing, just for materialities uh, and context for some of the some of the audience on the call. You know, we're talking about one of our 234 assets that is um, the NAV, I believe consensus NAV is in the teens. Um, so, you know, given a $3 billion odd US uh, billion dollar market cap uh, right now, that hopefully is useful context. Mm -hmm. and, and to confirm, Sean and Sheldon, so I guess the the stream and also the, or the royalty and the promissory notes, they're all secured on the assets of Moss or Elevation Gold. They're just... So you do have a right to recover your your investment, but you are just trying to be conservative. Yeah, yeah, that that's that, that's right, cause we're we're first secured on that. Um, the, the stream, I you know, the, the stream is again, it's a it's a silver stream on a gold silver project in in 
in, in the United States. Um, but when we look at the total burden on the property, we think that, you know, the credit loss is just a prudent way to go. Um, and, and that's, you know, so we've taken that and we try to be quite upfront about that. Yeah. And, and you know, I understand your point, uh, Sean, about materiality. So for sure. Those are my questions. And uh, thanks once again. Uh, thanks, Coach. Thank you. Great questions. Our next question comes from the line of Greg Barnes with TV Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Sean, can you talk a little bit about what the grade profile does look like at North Park for the rest of 2024? And you said higher grade in 25 and 26. Just give us some idea of what we should be looking at there. Thank morning, Greg. I'm, I'm going to ask um, <clears throat> James just to comment with him, you know, what's disclosed extension. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so as discussed, uh, the E31 south and north, they're continuing to ramp up. You should see that growth continue into Q2 and level off for us, three and four. Um, and then the state itself will start to uh, continue into 2025 and then start to uh, ramp down going into the fourth quarter of 2025. Uh, and then after that, then it's E22, which uh, is, you know, we're waiting for that study to be released. Uh, and then that'll be the next uh, higher grade zone once that's constructed. And Greg, you you may recall, um, you know, we've shared some of the, the grades like E22 from memory with something like 0.39 grams a ton. Um, you know, so that that really was the it, it, you could sort of think of that when that becomes the mainstay of the mine plan um, as really being at the sort of levels we expect to see this year. Uh, continuing for for many years beyond. I think um, this year for some may have been a show me for North Park. So I think hopefully this quarter is a helpful indicator of uh, what we've been talking about uh, for for gold generation from the asset. Okay, I just James, you broke up a little bit. I couldn't really hear what what's happening in Q2 and Q3. I think that was this year. Oh, so geo, sorry for Q2. We're expecting geos to increase again. Um, as well as uh, into Q3, and then leveling off, um, and then going into uh, 2025, before ramping down kind of later in that year for the, the pits and the higher grade material. Did, did you did you get that correct? So higher GEOs in Q2 and Q3, then flatlining at that level in Q4, I think for 2024, and then 2025. Sort of sorry? continuing on and. Uh, yeah, I think the only thing on that is, um, as, as you'd appreciate it, we get like, I don't know, was it 13 deliveries roughly? They're fairly lumpy during the year. So, you know, there are shoulder um, uh, phenomena that we do get with this. We try to factor that into our guidance. So, you know, you need to see through that as you think about the year versus the quarter. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Greg. That, anything else? Nope, nope. That's it for me. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes on the line with Doge Ben. Please go ahead. Hello, is that me? Tanya, I think it was. Yeah, good morning. Okay. All right, good morning. I just didn't know who that was. So um, thank you for taking my questions and congrats on, on a good quarter. Um I'm just going to follow up on uh, Greg's question. Is North Park the only asset within your portfolio that is looking to have this stronger performance and everything else is relatively equal? I'm just trying to see if there's any other assets that I should think about as a stronger second half. No, Sonia, I think that's that's a good way to look at it. Um, you know, I think it's something we've made no bones about is, um, you know, we – don't just take the aggregation of the public guidance of the operating assets in our portfolio and sort of put those out there. Um, you know, our guidance is sort of handicapped accordingly. And I think we telegraphed quite well in advance last year that we were expecting this sort of growth to, you know, come from uh, E31 and from North Parks this year. So, you know, it's a meaningful cat catalyst from a very well-established multi-decade long mine, which, you know, I think should be well celebrated and recognized. And then the growth is not coming from, you know, Hail Mary stuff. We're, we're waiting to come in later. And, and you know, just to B 
beat the dead horse on this. But, you know, I think that is the beauty of the portfolio effect on this, again, is little things like Kensington. We have over 200 of these things that at some different time horizons that are not captured in our guidance. You know, we do expect some subset of these to also represent good growth for our investors. But I think the way you and Greg are, are thinking about it is is exactly right. Okay. Thank you. And then, uh, Sheldon, can you remind me just um, the – Book value of Moss and Pumpkin Hollow, the two uh, two ones that are you know with not so strong operators. Yeah, so so Tanya um, Moss, the, the stream has a book value of uh, just, just under it's around eighteen nineteen million dollars. Um, Pumpkin Hollow, the the stream has a book value of uh, of eighty five million dollars. Okay. And then how should I think of um, just, um, you know, this cash flow that you're generating? How should I think about your balance between paying off your debt, your share buyback, and potentially growing your dividends? Maybe that's over to you, Sean, for that one. Thanks. Yeah, um, I'll give Sheldon that mic. He's, uh, he's marinates in it pretty much every day. All right. <laughs> Sheldon, over to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, so Tanya, um, I'll maybe start with like the, the first, I think, and best use of our, our cash flow is accretive transactions for, for shareholders. And, you know, as you know, we're always looking at, at things and, um, and and hoping to deploy. And right now we're, we're well positioned for that. Um, the dividend, we've increased that every year since we've been public. Um, I would expect that to continue um, probably at a similar pace, uh, but we'll we'll wait for further in the year for any sort of update on that. Um, you know, as you get cash flow and you have net debt, it's really simple. You just pay down your, your net debt. But we're we're quite comfortable drawing on our revolver to uh, to, to, to make acquisitions um, and to you know add value to shareholders that way. Uh, we don't like uh, share dilution, so uh, you know we we look to use the revolver strategically and then pay down over 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 time. Um, NCIB, we've been quite active uh, over time, and we continue to. To use that to, to view that like opportunistically. Again, it's returning capital to shareholder, and uh, our, our feedback from shareholders has been positive on that front. Okay, and then maybe Sean, to you, just on the you know Cosmos's question on the M and A environment, transaction environment. Um, so, did I understand correctly the the larger transactions, the 500 million plus that are um, you know spoken about out there, and there's like a couple. So I, mean, I heard three, four maybe even five in that sort of range. Are you looking at those in terms of your ability to, 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 to do them only as syndicated or would you also um, look at doing those on your own? No, so it's a it's a great question. I think firstly, um, you know, I, I, was, I was looking at some of the transcripts of, you know, Franco's calls, you know, they've telegraphed it and I think you may have covered the question at the time and I think what we're seeing is very very similar to, you know, I think what was articulated there. So there's no short, there's always development stuff. Um, you know, you've got to be very discerning how much of that exposure you want. But I think for the first time and perhaps since our existence, we are seeing these sort of half a billion plus or thereabouts type transactions re-emerging that I think we last saw in sort of 2014, 2015. I think the one thing that's different, which we've sort of highlighted with our board, if you take yourself back to that time, and you remember we did one of these at Barrick when I was there at CFO, um, rates were close to zero. And, um, you know, the commodity prices, or these gold prices, were at nearly cyclical lows for, you know, quite some time. We are not in that same space. So we're spending a lot of time thinking through the risk, reward, and portfolio fit. I'd say with um, a couple that we are active on, we are comfortable that the check size is one that we would easily finance um, and you know these are cash generating assets so it actually adds to our funding capacity and we wouldn't be over levered um, the other one is one where it's not clear whether or not it's just a thing on cost of capital and fit or indeed um, they would want to go for size uh, I believe we're more than covered and if not we may be a, a syndicate member what we won't do is pursue growth for growth's sake uh, none of these are must do's uh, for us at all. I mean, you can see our growth that we, we have in the existing portfolio. This is purely a, a, a question of does it fit with our strategy and will it add value over time? 
Okay, so from that, should I be thinking that, you know, sort of these larger ones would be ones that likely could be syndicated and you would, you know, participate in that, but the majority of what you're looking at would be sub 500 million? Would that be a fair way of thinking about it? Um, yeah, I think that's a reasonable way of looking at it. Um, it it's hard on, you know, we, we were talking in generalities. The specifics are so different in each of these cases. Um, each with their sort of real benefits and complexities, as you'd expect. So it's really hard for me to comment any further. But I think we are at the size we're at and with what we have, and I think what we've demonstrated. You know, remember, we did North Parks at 550 million a few years ago. Uh -huh. At the time, that was the largest just pure pressure streaming deal in the space, I think still to this to this day. We're starting to see these larger things come out. So um, if, we, if the North Parks emerge tomorrow, we'd, you know, I think we'd easily cover that off. Um, but, uh, yeah, so hopefully that gives you a, a flavor, Tanya. All right. I, I, I gathered plus 500 you could do on your own as well. All yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, I think that's it from my uh, and, and so what, Yeah, Go sorry, ahead. maybe just to nuance on this. If, you know, if this was that sort of check size and you were funding something which had a ramp associated and cash flow many years out, it's a very different prospect to an operating asset with, you know, maybe some substantial immediate cash flow uh, that takes yeah, it. So, no, I, you know, uh, that, that it yeah. would be a producing yeah. there's, a, there's a bunch of that. Yeah, that. yeah, that. Yeah, it, it's a pretty interesting environment. Yeah, and I would assume that the smaller ones would be further out, um, non-producing development type. No, no, actually, no, that's not the case. Um, I hope to give you some news uh, in, in the months ahead, but. No, we're seeing, um, you know, this this environment is not super supportive of um, single asset producers, private businesses, and um, others. I think that uh, even though we've perhaps seen a, a bit of a reduction in some of the inflation and margin compression that the sector has experienced, I think there's a lot of guys out there who are looking at their equity and saying, like, what happened? Um, you know, gold's had a run and we've been left behind. So I think um, we, we, are, we are seeing some really decent rate of return, good optionality, smaller opportunities that are just great tuck-ins. And yeah, we're, we're active on some of those too. Okay, good. Look forward to seeing more. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Next question comes from the line of Lawson Winder, with DOA Securities. Please go ahead. Thank you, operator, and good morning, Sean and team. Thanks for taking the question and for the presentation today. Um, I'd like to ask about um, Pumpkin Hollow and, and you know, two two points on that. I mean, I mean, one, obviously, um, I mean, I think they they require some more fan financing and wanted to understand whether or not uh, Triple Flag would consider um, applying additional capital to that uh, situation. Um, and I think in the context of you guys still believing in, in the asset longer term, correct me if I'm wrong, and then and then longer term, I mean, when should we kind of think about uh, putting some production from that asset in, into our, our model, particularly vis-a-vis -vis your long-term guidance? Yeah, Wilson, it's, um, yeah, as you know, this has been a, an asset that has been on our growth um, outlook for some time. It's one of our five larger um, you know, projects that we were funding into production. I'd say it's been quite notable and it's sort of struggles with inflation and, and uh, liquidity from time to time. So to your point, we, we lost supported us in, in you know, a couple of years ago, really with the, with the royalty and some funding that was secured in line with our model. I don't see a scenario here where we look to continue to add to the burden, if you will, of the asset and to continue to fund us through. We will focus on, if we do any capital, it'll be small uh, in this scenario where they don't secure the funding they need. And really, it's just really to optimize value uh, from our perspective. You know, I think there's nearly a billion dollars of sunk capital on a copper asset in a permitted situation with a fully developed underground mine and a shovel ready open pit. I think it's an intrinsically valuable situation. So I can't tell you sitting here today whether the party or parties that they're engaged with, which would um, you know, uh, provide that remaining capital and continue to grow the asset, will come to fruition. Um, I guess what we really wanted to communicate was update you on that and just make it clear that um, 
you know, we uh, what, what our, our situation, our ranking would be, depending which fork in the road this was to go down. But you shouldn't expect us to be, you know, like a big equity check to get this into production or something. Sheldon, I don't know if there's anything you'd add. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Thanks, Lawson. Yeah, like so. So Nevada Copper, like they've disclosed that they're, uh, you know, they're they're in discussions with a, with another party and that they need they need more capital. So I think everyone everyone knows that. Um, you know, we certainly do believe in the asset, uh, copper, United States, all the sum capital, all those all those reasons. But that said, um, we're not we're not operators. Um, we have no desire to be operators, so we're not going to be the source of the funding to bring this uh, this into production. And um, and uh, you know, it, we we just. Uh, we we probably uh, we've we've invested our our piece and as Sean said we don't want to add to the to the burden there so hopefully that gives you the direction uh, you know that thing. yeah and also I think the last thing and I look forward to hearing more at your conference next week but uh, I think it's probably the best copper backdrop I can remember in some time so you know you would think if they could solve the liquidity uh, situations and you got a levered asset in this backdrop in the United States um, that should be good right. Yeah, makes sense to me, and I appreciate the clarity. It's very helpful. Um, could I also just ask on your thinking around corporate M&A? Obviously, your last uh, experience, I mean, at least in my view, I, I think was was very successful. Um, are you still looking at that as an avenue for growth going forward, and, and do you see opportunity in the current environment? Yeah, um, <clears throat> look, I, I think to your point, it's uh, – it, you know, I, I spent the large part of my career in companies like Extrada that really grew substantially through m and I worked on the BSV Billiton merger, and, for example, and you know, the, the power of uh, people not falling in love with their, their assets because I think everybody likes to – they know more about their businesses than others. They always think that their children are smarter and better looking than everyone else's. But if you just focus on value – I think at any given time, you have a very good line of sight and you should be focusing, as we all do, on the organic pipeline, your ability to transact. But if you go back to your point to Mavericks, we just come through an environment of a couple of years where we'd normally do a few few hundred million dollars a year. And we saw billions get deployed in mostly development stage assets with very low returns versus an M&A transaction that, you know, that was accretive, made sense for both sets of shareholders, struck at a low premium that really delivered synergies and made value. I don't know why that isn't an obvious thing more for the sector. So directly to your question, yes, we're always looking at the universe of the possible. There's only so many toys to play with. And, you know, just to reiterate the obvious, that I'm very happy as a shareholder whether that means we're an, a, an acquirer or an acquiree. But... Um, I think usually the social barriers are the largest to consolidation in the sector. I do think that the investor um, the scale requirements these days for it to be relevant are higher, like notably higher than when we started our company in 16. So I think that's a factor that should be a feature in every boardroom and every management team. And I think when we look at um, you know the, the, the sort of menu of possibilities, very small things we tend to struggle with, like Mavericks, if you recall, had a lot of assets, but more than half the NAV that we acquired came from 14 assets, over, and there was over 100, as you recall, which were generating cash. A lot of the really small stuff, there's a lot of NAV, which is quite long dated, um, and we often struggle to see our path to value there, even though on a PNAV basis, they might seem well discounted. And then, yeah, with whether it's intermediates or seniors, you know, if uh, if there's sensible things to do, we're we're always open to them. But yeah, there's there's barriers there. So probably more than you you wanted to hear, but hopefully that gives you a sense. We're we're always open for business if there's business to be done. Uh, the, there's never too little. Let's put it that way. Thank you very much for those <laughs> comments. Yeah. Don't worry. Thanks, Wilson. See you next week. Our next question comes from the line of Brian McCarter with Raymond James. Please go ahead. Good morning, and thank you for taking my questions. Um, we've heard a number of people talk about these big deals potentially out there are 500 million plus and refer back to the last cycle where, you know, it's all for debt restructuring. Can I just 
when people talk numbers of 500, can I, can I assume those are true streaming deals, meaning they're not like, say, 300 of streaming and you're putting 300 of equity in or something? Because as you've mentioned, you know, these deals are getting more hybrid, more complicated in the sector. I mean, I'm just trying to figure out to make sure that these are what I would call true streaming lower risk deals as opposed to complicated uh, financing transactions? Yeah, Brian, good to good to hear from you. It's, it's a really good question. Um, it's funny, uh, I'd say a year or so ago, I started getting questions from investors at conferences and elsewhere about, you know, are, is Triple Flag going to start doing more hybrid deals because we've seen some larger guys do it and, you know, we've seen the private guys like Orion do that very successfully. I believe it concentrates risk and it violates the model. So it's very clear that we're not going to engage in doing that, and we haven't. So don't expect anything along those lines from us. Um, and directly to your question, no, these are these are streaming deals. Um, it isn't, uh, hey, boy, have we got a deal for you. Here's half a billion dollars, but yeah, as you say, 300 of that is a stream, and you're going to lob in a $200 million equity check. Um, so no, they, they, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're streaming deals. Um, and I think... You know, the, in many cases, uh, it is stuff that just represents at a moment in time perhaps a, a better alternative on cost of funding, uh, either balance sheet repair, improving liquidity, or things of that nature is just how to think about it. Thank you. That's very clear. Also what I wanted to hear. Um, second question, just a different vein a little bit. Can you just go through the rationale at um, – ATO and step. I mean, again, we do another prepaid, which is another type of financing. Again, is that just, you know, they're ramping up? Is it the seasonal working capital you're doing this for? Or, you know, I'm, I assume this is nothing like elevation or anything else to be clear for everybody. But if you could just give a little bit of rationale for that. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask Sheldon to expand on this. But I think the important thing is, you know, from time to time, we have assisted where the, the capital markets for these guys are brutal. And um, we've done this once or twice with STEP where we made a good return on our money. It was a you know, very helpful financing for them. Um, yeah, and, and that's a partnership, as you call, goes back, I think it was our second transaction. So these guys, you know, we've helped them IPO. We've helped them deliver successfully. They've got this transaction now. They need some bridge funding. We're happy to assist. It's a decent return. Um, and it's a team that I think is, you know, demonstrating some ambition and growth and a, a very strong Mongolian champion. But um, Sean, what would you add to that? Yeah, thanks, Sean. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, so so step. Uh, it, it's actually a pretty impressive story if you if you see what they've accomplished o- over the years. Um, they're a relatively small company, and they were, you know, managed to find financing, a significant amount of financing for phase two. Uh, we benefit from that, which is fantastic. Um, it was a bit of a, it was a heavy lift for, for them. Q1's often uh, a, a harder quarter for them uh, just due to the Mongolian winter. And this particular winter in Mongolia was particularly uh, particularly uh, hard. Um, and they basically uh, asked us for, for, some, for some funding to, to help them out there. Um, we were happy to give that because we could see the, the value there. Um, and actually, since that trans- since we did that prepay with uh, with Step, the um, you know the Buru transaction got got announced, and that's actually a real game changer for them. Uh, it's going to really give them some really good, robust cash flows um, that marry up quite well with the development project they have with the the phase two uh, ex- expansion. Um, the, the rates of return uh, were obviously attractive for us. So we, we quite frankly got a little lucky on the gold price uh, timing, um, and that's and that's just the way the way it worked out. And sorry, that was going to be my second question, but this was kind of independent of the Baru transaction, right? It was just a seasonal thing you were helping them get through, or, or I mean, in a sense, I don't think of it as funding that transaction or anything. No, it's not funding that transaction. It's independent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's well. And maybe my third question under the category of hidden assets, or I don't know if it's hidden or not, but you obviously highlighted some good value in Kensington, which had been worked on for a year. Is there any um, possibility of getting any value out of Almelon? Is, is anything happening there anymore, or is that just totally very difficult? Look, we, we, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, we've got um, a contractual entitlement, but as you know, we've, we've written that down. We did that on the announcement of the transaction. Uh, we made, made it clear that we are not um, guiding investors to expect anything, but we do have a contractual entitlement that perhaps in the future is 
could have some value. I just wouldn't want to, you know, raise any expectations to that effect. I think it's just one of those bags of things that perhaps in the future could unlock some value for for shareholders. Yeah, sure. Fair enough. Thank. Yeah. It just, just, you know, when we when we bought Mavericks, um, we ascribed zero value to Omelon, so there was no there was no write down associated with, with that. We just we just ascribed zero value to it, and uh, you know we did that transaction after the Ukrainian war had started, so we kind of had some good visibility uh, there. And and like Sean said, I mean we have a contractual entitlement. Uh, it's a great ore body. We like the mine, but uh, obviously the Russia factor um, means we're we're putting zero value on it right now. And I wouldn't encourage anyone to put any value on it uh, right now. Uh, History is long and times may change, but I wouldn't put anything on it right now. Yeah. Great. Thanks for answering all my questions. No, thanks, Brian. Our next question comes from the line of John Timesos. Please go ahead. Good morning. Some of your um, assets here, smaller companies where I apologize, I might not be current. What percentage complete is Pumpkin Hollow, or how much money do they need uh, to complete the project? Hey, John, I'll um, I'll ask Sheldon to comment on that one for us. Um, yeah, Sheldon, what would you like to say? Yeah, John, it's it's pretty difficult for us to 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 give that figure because that that's obviously uh, Nevada Copper's uh, about Ballywick. I don't. I don't think they put that number out in the public domain, and and we just uh, we just don't have the freedom and maneuver to to give that figure. Concerning some of your non-producing properties uh, that are making progress, how many years out, or what year or range of years do you think might be first revenue? In Hope Bay, South Railroad, Tamarack, or Fen Gibb? Yeah, John, I know, um, I think it was in our prior corporate updates um, that we had at the conferences. We tried to provide, you know, some sense of a, um, you know, five and a 10 year window for those sort of small, smaller royalties that we touch on. You would see that the 140, thousand GEO, you know, bearing in mind last year was what, 105, we're guiding 105 to 115 this year, and then that 140 average on the five year um, really is, is focused on mostly the producing assets with very limited contribution from any of these smaller things. So you, you've got that bucket of nearly 200, I think, um, you know, to your point, we've got some opportunity, I think, in the periods ahead to look a little bit more at the advance and be able to draw some attention from an investor point of view at those subsets. I think things like, you know, Kensington is an example where none of these are massive in their own right. Um, but as a collective, these are things that I think can actually add over time to some meaningful GEOs and, and um, our performance. And then to your point on Hope Bay, it's been interesting. Um, I was on a, as an investor conference uh, in Zurich recently, Amar was talking about you know, the significant progress they're making there. I know they're talking about perhaps three, 400,000 ounces a year, uh, and they're getting some good exploration results there. So, you know, our hope is certainly before the end of this decade, uh, they're the right operator in that location. They're clearly investing significant money and time, and we've got a, a pretty meaningful royalty on there. So I think in that sort of time frame, we'd hope to see a uh, good contribution starting to come from that. Sheldon, anything you'd add to No, I think that covers it really well, Sean. Yeah, and John, I think to your point, it's a good nudge for us to also, you know, focus beyond, because we've always tried to focus on growth, uh, risk, and optionality. And I think as we've done a bit to highlight some of that optionality, I know there's a lot of guys dying out on that, but I think we need to do more to probably showcase more of that opportunity for investors. Concerning Agbau, Kone, and NC in Africa, do those operators have a target date for production, and are they in your longer-term five-year forecast? Um, yes, they do, and uh, we have included. Um, you wouldn't think of them as being massive geo contributors, but we've gone on their public guidance as we've um, as we thought about. It. And again, I. 
I'll draw your attention to, it's on our website. Um, you know, we've got a short summary of a couple of those royalties and that's both in the, the five year and then the sort of 10 year time frame. Thank you. Thanks, John. There are no further questions at this time. I'll turn the call back over to Mr. Sean. Yeah, Jericho, thank you. And uh, thanks, everyone. There's uh, a great collection of questions. Um, look, I'll, I'll just end by saying thank you to our partners and our team. It's great to start off with the record quarter. Um, you know, a, a very, well, I think, our busiest deal pipeline and a pretty handy uh, commodity price backdrop for, for this company. So we just turned eight. Um, it's been an exciting eight years, a good start to 2024. And I'm really excited to see what uh, what lies in store for us uh, for the remainder of this year. So with that, um, all, all the best for the rest of your day.